We've been studying for a while the notion of stewardship. Uh, stewardship is a great topic because it talks about how to manage our lives for God, how to live for Him. Um, and we, what we've done in this first half of this uh, study is to look at different ways to think about stewardship, different paradigms uh, to think about. I started off a couple weeks back um, thinking of stewardship as God's method for searching for people who, who want to work with Him for eternity. And then the last two weeks, uh, Bill had a couple of great uh, themes. I, I noticed both of them in his prayer just now, that uh, stewardship is a way of investing in God's kingdom, and stewardship is a way of reflecting on God's great generosity to us. Today we're going to look at stewardship, different paradigm. It's about wealth management. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's going to be wealth management conceived a little bit differently than the world does. This is going to be all about protecting us and being uh, blessings to other. I'm going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm not going to flash the uh, text up. I'm going to read through it, and then we'll go back through it. I'll put it up there. Uh, this is a letter of Paul to Timothy, Timothy a protege. And Paul is telling Timothy how to be a pastor. And so he's going to talk about uh, contrasting what he's supposed to be doing with some other men who are, who are not preaching well, and talks about how they're being distracted because they're after money. And then he's going to, I'm going to skip a little section where he tells Timothy to be different. And then he goes back to talk about what he's supposed to teach the congregation, what pastors are supposed to teach the congregation, especially those who have money, about how to use it. So 1 Timothy 6, I'm going to read verses 3 to 10, then jump down to verse 17, then to 19. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he's conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction among men, between men of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Oh, sorry. Like every pastor, Timothy had to learn the connection between faith and life, between accurate teaching, accurate doctrine, and obedient living. They're supposed to go together. False doctrines, serious false doctrines, they're not, they're not simply intellectual mistakes. Paul says here that serious errors like that in teaching come from personal conceit. The weakness of people who are supposed to be representing Christ, substituting their own ideas or their own intuition for what God has clearly said in his word, rather than just humbly teach what God says. He talks about these men of corrupt mind. And the worst of them, he says, are those who use their position of influence to raise funds which directly or indirectly make themselves rich. Paul has talked about them in Corinthians. He talks about them uh, in other places. It was a scourge on the church from the very first century until now. Now, just a, a chapter earlier, in this very letter, Paul clearly taught that pastors ought to be financially supported by the congregation. But there is a big difference between just compensation and men who use religion to make themselves rich. Now, Paul goes on to say here that godliness will make you rich, but not with money. The reward of faith is the contentment that it brings. 
Because faith puts life into a larger and a much more stable perspective. Without faith, our possessions become the stuff of life itself. We think this is what it is. This is what life's all about. But when we come to faith in Christ, our possessions just become traveling luggage on a journey. Luggage that we're no longer going to need when we arrive home. And so faith makes possible an experience which is otherwise rather rare in the world, and that is contentment. Contentment is a choice. And it's one of the hardest choices in life. In fact, it's so hard, Paul teaches here, that there's only one place that it's really kind of possible to make it. It's really hard to make it anywhere else but in one place, and it's the boundary between poverty and wealth when it comes to a lifestyle. The boundary between poverty and wealth. The Bible has a lot to say about poverty. Poverty is a lack of the basic necessities of life. Poverty can be the consequence of laziness or uh, foolishness. But in the Bible, more often than that, poverty is the result of oppression. The oppression of those who use the system to benefit themselves at the expense, at the express expense of others. You'll find it in every nation. You'll find it in every culture, no matter what it is. There are those who become very wealthy at the expense of others. When you're poor, you're, you're miserable. You, you, you know, there may be contentment to be found there in a spiritual sense, but in so many ways you're miserable because just getting by is a struggle. It's hard to live. The Bible also has much to say about being wealthy, about being rich, having a lot more uh, money than you need. Wealth can be the natural result of hard work and business success, and that is commended to us, especially in the Proverbs. God wants us to work hard, and he wants that hard work to be rewarded appropriately, and we're supposed to enjoy the things that he gives us to enjoy. But on a, on a larger scale, it can also be said that wealth is often the result of oppressions. The flip side of what we already said, the people in power can use the system to benefit themselves at the expense of others, not caring about other people, and that's true in every culture and every nation. Paul says here that in, in this text that our contentment thrives, it may exist elsewhere, but it thrives in the oasis, the lifestyle oasis between poverty and riches. It's kind of a Goldilocks zone between not having enough to live in peace and having a lot more than we clearly need and not knowing what to do with it but to spend it on ourselves. It's very, very hard to be content outside of the Goldilocks zone. That's why it's the place where a wise person des desires to live. We're not talking about how much money they have. We're talking about how much money to use for living. Nobody wants to be poor. Nobody wants to deny themselves unnecessarily, to struggle each day to survive, to worry about the necessities of life in your own society. That can drive you to desperate ends. Millions and millions of people live in poverty today. Just getting by is a worry, and nobody, nobody wants that or should want that. But it's only the wise who are concerned about being rich. They're concerned about having more than they need and making that the rule of their lifestyle. Because wealth weaves the illusion that you are artificially independent. Well, in some ways, it's not an illusion. You can, wealthy can do things other people can't do and choose things that poor people can't. But the illusion can't be sustained. Paul says here it's uncertain. The wealth can, of course, disappear overnight. But we know it's going to disappear when you stand before your maker. You're not going to have any more money before your maker uh, that you accumulate. Uh, than anyone else who does on that day. And even in this life, the rich typically cannot know contentment any more than the poor. Hard to believe, but it is true. What you need is that green zone there. You need a natural boundary. That green zone is, is a lifestyle that, that, that uh, uses enough money to meet my needs, okay? If we have food and clothing and all the other things that we need to live, then we should be uh, happy. It, it, but if you don't have that zone, then uh, there is no natural boundary at all. You could pretend there's one out there. You could say, well, I just want to go that far. I want to just spend that much more than I need on myself. But 
it doesn't work that way. Uh, Solomon said, whoever loves money is never going to have money enough. And whoever loves wealth is never going to be satisfied with their income. So once you get beyond what you need, there is no natural boundary for our desires. Any boundary we think we're going to be happy attaining will find to be a mirage when we get there. And the pursuit of wealth becomes a trackless desert. You keep seeing a mirage. I'll be happy if I get over to there. And then when you get there, it's gone. A trackless desert. And we end up punishing ourselves with a thirst we can't quench. It's a self-destruction. Paul in the text talked about piercing ourselves with many griefs. God's not doing it to us. Nobody else is doing it to us. We're doing it to ourselves. In 2010, this biblical insight was documented by the Wall Street Journal. They talked about a major Gallup survey. They, the Gallup uh, uh, organization interviewed 450,000 Americans. It's a lot of people. And what they did was they compared annual income and they plotted that against two subjective feelings. One was, was a day-to-day -day sense of well-being, which the analysts would call happiness. And the other was an overall assessment of one's place in the world or how much better off you thought you must be in comparison to others. And they found that both of those feelings rose in proportion to the level of income people had. That doesn't seem too surprising. But what was surprising was that there was a level, an actual measurable level of income at which a person's sense of day-to-day -day happiness ceased to rise when they had their needs met. After that point, it didn't matter how much a person made, they didn't get any happier in real life, day-to-day -day terms. But the theoretical sense of being better off did continue to rise indefinitely. The more people made, the more people thought they must be better off than other people. And that just kept going and going and going and going and never ended, never, never, never uh, 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 flattened out at all. So, uh, well, by the way, what was the income? I was curious. Uh, the income where it diverged was $75,000. Now, the Wall Street Journal editors asked the same question I did when I read, read this, and that is they sure wish that it had been broken down by region and family size. Certainly that figure is going to be very different for very di people, what meets their needs. That was just an average. However, what it showed was that for each of us, there exists a narrow range of income which in our own situation provides for our needs, whatever they are. For some, it's going to be less than 75000 For some, it might be more. But once we allow ourselves to think that we're going to be better off by having more than that, we start climbing a hill with no summit. And we can never get any happier. Now, of course, you know the Bible doesn't say there's not a thing wrong with money. And people who work hard and are talented and have opportunity are usually blessed with greater income. And the Bible says that's good. And some inherit money, and that's a blessing. There's nothing wrong at all with having more money than you need. But desiring a lifestyle that costs more than you need, the thought, I'm going to use that excess just on me to raise myself up higher and higher, that is a trap. It is a trap. It's what Paul calls the love of money. And it is a root of all kinds of evil. In this text, Paul is not trying to, to lace some guilt trip on anybody. He's trying to keep people he loves from a trap that will ruin them. Because the pursuit of wealth beyond what you need to live, using it just for yourself, will tear your focus away from Christ. You'll never get any happier. And that never-ending quest will make your life miserable. And he wants to save us from that. So does that mean that we should never seek wealth? Not at all. It doesn't mean that. Seeking a rich lifestyle can be dangerous for your soul. But that doesn't mean wealth has no value. You see, while every one of us can do good, 
people who have more money than they need can do good on a larger scale. And that's very significant. Money can be a lifesaver for people who are in need. Did you know, did you know that having and using money to help others is a spiritual gift? It's listed there with teaching and all the other gifts. That involves a willingness to share, but it also involves the opportunity to give that comes from having more money than you need. People who have this gift are able to make money. They're just very good at it, and they know how to use it to make a difference. And Paul says, that's a gift. That's a spiritual gift. John Wesley had a slogan about money that's very well remembered. You know, earn all you can, give all you can, save all you can. But the drive behind the use of resources, and of course we're talking about money, but really this goes with all the resources we have. The drive behind the use of resources uh, is, that we ought to have is best summed up by another one of his quotes that I just love, and that is to do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And that's what Wesley did. He never had any kind of a group meeting. He was famous for his small group meetings. In his small groups, they always passed the plate around. He insists that they collect money every time because there were so many, so many people who needed it, so much ways to use it. It's very important for Wesley. And that brings us to verse 19. Verse 19 contains perhaps the most powerful insight in the whole text. Let me just lift it up higher so you can see it. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Not a fake life, but life that is truly life. Here Paul defines the proper use of wealth as a Christian. The proper stewardship of wealth. The proper stewardship of wealth requires that we redefine in our minds what wealth is. You know, when you and I sign on to follow Christ, we sign on to a way of thinking that is upside down from so many things we find in the world. Christ doesn't say you shouldn't want to be great. You should want to be great. Just understand that it's the great or the servant of the others. That if you want to lead, you got to serve. The best leader isn't the boss, it's the servant. Okay? You turn it upside down. This is another case where the Christian idea is the reverse of the secular one. The world says that our wealth grows as we accumulate, right? Obvious? God says our wealth grows, and we want it to grow, our wealth grows as we give. It's upside down. It's as we use our money and everything else that we have to do good that our money transforms into a true and eternal form of wealth for us. Paul calls it becoming rich in good deeds. See, God counts our wealth and he wants us to be wealthy not by the money we take in, but by the money we give away to help others. You can accumulate as much money as you want. That never makes you rich in God's sight. It's only when you spend money to do good that you actually grow in wealth. I mean, isn't that wild? But that's what it says. And it's true for everybody, even if you only have a couple of uh, copper pennies to give. But if you have a lot of money, you have the potential of becoming very rich in good deeds. You aren't rich just because you have the money. You, got it. you become rich if you use it. You can become rich. Paul and Jesus both sp spoke. He, Paul here and Jesus is famous in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you, you store up treasure in heaven. You can actually do that. Imagine a heavenly bank account. That bank account doesn't budge as you put money into your earthly one. That bank account doesn't budge as you spend your earthly money on yourself. Nothing wrong with that. You're supposed to enjoy it, but it doesn't change anything there. But as you spend money to help others, your heavenly account rises, storing up treasure in heaven. It's as if spending money on others is like a bank transfer to heaven. Spending money on yourself, that's fine. It's gone. Spend it to help somebody else, and it's not gone. You've transferred it to an eternal account. Store up treasure in heaven. I'm going to leave you with some questions. 
They're just questions, they aren't answers because I'm still asking them myself, all right? This has been a hard week working through this message just to try to plumb the depths of it. If you're going to write anything down, write these questions down. I'm not going to answer them for you, but you want to think about them. First question, am I content with what I have? I mean, we can get all theoretical about what, how much money I should spend, but just ask that question. Am I content? Am I content with what I have? If not, well, where am I with regard to that narrow green oasis? Am I, un, if I, am I inside of it? Am I poor? Poverty is a very hard thing to think about in our culture, isn't it? Because m most people in the world would look at our lifestyle and say, well, you're rich, and they'd be right. On the other hand, if your mortgage is underwater and you don't have a job, you can't pay your bills, isn't that the definition of poor? It's very difficult. We're in a hard situation. It's part of our national discussion right now. What does it mean? How, do I have enough to survive? I mean, do I have enough luggage to see me through my journey home? Maybe I can't get a job. Maybe I can't pay my bills. If I'm poor, I need to cry out to God for mercy because he hears the needs of the poor. And you shouldn't be afraid of putting yourself in that category. God hears those cries. And we need to ask the Christian family to help us. All of us are poor at one time or another. Mickey and I have been poor at one time. Everybody is. Not everybody, but, but, but often we go in and out of that. So, you know, did you know, apart from the general fund that we're going to talk about tonight, there's also a deacon's fund in the church. This is money you can, you can put in any time you want. You just say on your envelope or a check that it's for the deacon's fund. That's money we entrust to our deacons, and it's not for church, pay church bills. It's to help the poor right in our midst, especially those of us here in this room who may need it. And they manage that money responsibly and carefully and discreetly. And there is nothing they enjoy more than the privilege of spending it, giving it to people who are in need, especially those of us. You may, you may give to it at some point and take some out of it other times when you need it. If I'm not content with what I have, am I poor? Or am I on the other side? Have I wandered out, into the oasis, uh, out of the oasis of contentment into the desert of wanting to live at a higher standard than I have, more than I need, that desert that never ends and in which there are no more oases? If that's the case, if that's where I am, then how long do I intend to stay there? If you find that you say, I am content with what I have, then you really, really, really need to rejoice because you are living in the very best place there is to live, no matter how much money you got. If you're content, that's where God wants you to be. He wants his children to be very happy and very content. Second question. If I have more money than I need, what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? Elsewhere, Paul urged us to remember the words of the Lord Jesus himself when he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. The best giving, the most blessed comes from giving like him, giving sacrificially. Bill spoke about that last week. It's giving from a generous heart. I'm not talking about that. Paul's not talking about giving sacrificially in this text. It's great to do, but he's not talking about that. Paul here is talking about giving money away so you can avoid falling into a trap and becoming miserable. It's a very pastoral concern, the trap of discontent. The way out of the trap of discontent, unless you're poor, the way out of the trap of discontent is to spend your abundance on doing good. That will be good for your soul. It will keep you out of the desert. Now, you can give more than that. You can give generously. You can give sacrificially. You can give beyond your means. But here, Paul's not even talking about that. He's not talking about denying yourself. Use money for whatever you need. But protect yourself from that temptation and trap of always wanting more than that. I can maintain my contentment by spending my excess on others. Excess money is like steam building up in a boiler. It's not supposed to just sit there. It's supposed to be released to do some good work. I want to suggest to you three practical ways that you can do that. 
I'm sure there are others. These are three ways that I know of, Mickey and I have done, I think, two of them. Number one, I really encourage you to put into your personal budget money that is earmarked for giving away. A lot of people feel like giving money away should be a spontaneous thing when I feel like it. The problem with that is, what if you feel like you don't have any money? Okay? Budgeting, if you don't have a budget, please get a, make a budget. When we got married, Mickey convinced me very early on that I needed to learn how to live on a budget. And I've never regretted it. You put money aside in the budget and it's gone. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You just then use it for what you have it put there for. Put some one or more categories in your budget of money that's just to give away. And if you don't have much, try putting $5 in there. Something, something to give away. You might pledge some uh, monthly amount to some, some ministry that you love. Or you might put something away each month and then let it grow. When, when you see a need, it could be a need in the congregation, it could be a need you see on television. Some people that are hurting and suffering, hey, I've got some money that I can use. And then you just use it. It's wonderful. And Jesus says when you do that, it's best to do it anonymously because that way it's easiest just to praise God. Mickey and I do that. I mean, you have, you have taken such good care for us and you've determined a just wage uh, for me based on what I do and the length of time I've served and so on. But uh, it's more than I need to live on. So Mickey and I have a couple of funds that we set aside just to give money away. And, and that's, that's really for our sake. It's good for us. It's good for our soul. It's a wonderful thing when you see a need to have some money to use to set aside for it. Doesn't have to be a lot. It just needs to be enough to guard against the temptation to ratchet up your lifestyle as your income grows. That's a trap. Number two, a second way you can do it is put money aside when you get a windfall. A tax return, maybe an inheritance. Now, you might need that tax return to pay your bills. You might need your inheritance to get out of debt. You might want to use that windfall to very creatively do something to help your family bond, worship God together, whatever. But if there's some left over from whatever you need, consider just putting it aside, a chunk to give away. A few years back, I received a couple of inheritances, and it was a tremendous blessing for me. We paid off school loans. We paid off the mortgage on our house. We were very blessed. But there was a chunk that we didn't need, so we, we separated it out. We could have written one check and just had done with it, but it's too much fun. You know, when you have that money there, you can just use it whenever a problem comes up. Whenever you see something you want to do, you've got money. And it's just, it's glorious. For several years, we've, had, we've been enjoying on that. And it's one of, the, one of the joys of my life. It's just about gone now. So if any of you would like to give us some more money <laughs> that we could put aside, I would really love. Now, you think, you think I'm joking, don't you? I, I, I learned that this was great from a pastor friend of mine who lived in Virginia. This was a long time ago. And he told me that somebody in the congregation came up to him once and they gave him $50,000 with the proviso that he not spend any of it on himself. And for the next several years, he was just giving it away and he was so happy. He was just, it was so glorious that I always wanted that experience. And I'm glad God <laughs> gave it. <clears throat> and there's a third way. There's a third way, and this we haven't done. We have to, we'll start thinking about it. Uh, and that is... Um, and that is to stipulate gifts in your will. Stipulate gifts in your will. I mean, everybody wants to give to their children. I certainly do. But what we leave to our kids is not only property. It's also an example to follow, right? We could all bequeath some of our assets to help others. And it would be a wonderful thing to do. For example, and there are probably a thousand ways, and I don't know anything about finances, so I can't tell you, but one creative way I've seen is to take out a small life insurance policy, for example, and make it payable to a special ministry or cause. Some of those little policies aren't too expensive. And it's just imagine the joy of just spending a few dollars a month, and when you die, you leave $10,000 to go to the PCA fund to support uh, widows of former pastors who have no income for example. How do you think those widows would feel because you did that? How do you think Jesus would feel because you did that? Cool. Now, if you want more information on that kind of managed giving, I'm not the person to talk to, but I do know some people that you should talk to. I can, let, I can uh, direct you. This week, we've learned another paradigm 
the next several weeks we're going to look at specifics, but we're looking at ways of looking at stewardship. Stewardship is wealth management turned upside down from the world. Christian stewards create true wealth, not through what they accumulate, not through what they spend on themselves, which is appropriate to all of our needs, but they accumulate wealth through what they spend or give above what they themselves need in order to help others. That's wealth management for the Christian. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, depending on how soaked we are in consumerism, uh, Paul's words may sound very strange. But whether or not we fully understand and appreciate it all, we sense that you and your servant Paul are not trying to put us down. You're trying to save us from pursuing mirages in the desert for years on end. And by your grace and the gentle work of your spirit, we would really like to avoid or perhaps escape from that trap. But Father, I'm going to speak for, my, for myself. My brothers and sisters can join me if they wish. Father, this is a hard thing to do. Every day, while there's wonderful things I could do with money, there's, there's people who have great personal needs. There are institutions that need to be reclaimed. There's all kinds of ways to use money properly. At the same time, Whatever version of life we live today, there's always a version two or three or four that costs more and looks good. So, Father, I pray for Mickey and I, and I pray for all my brothers and sisters, that to the glory of Jesus Christ, we might do all the good we can, by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as ever we can. And I'm looking forward, Lord, to the day we get home and check in all of our luggage and discover the full measure of our wealth. Everything, everything we gave away in Jesus' name stored up for us just as you promised. Amen.